it took me a little bit longer to set this laptop, which is I mean, extra five minutes, but it's not, it's not really a big problem. Uh, right, so that's why we stopped yesterday. We did this lengthy computation, and you were, you, you stayed with me, and thank you for that. Now, I have two things today to discuss with you. One of them, why this is of, of relative importance, these computations. This is, mo this is mostly from, this mostly comes from the applications, uh, because uh, the, what is, what uh, physicists call the wave equation. It's a differential equation which describes the propagation of waves in space. It's something which has this piece, uh, f double x plus f double y, on one of this uh, on one of the sides of the differential equation you have to solve. And because uh, in the many classical settings, when you discuss wave prop propagation, uh, there is some sort of circular or spherical symmetry, and that's why solving that equation. Uh, becomes easier if you solve it in spherical or polar coordinates rather than in Cartesian coordinates. And that's why before you start solving that equation, you have to, you have to make this substitution into the polar or spherical, and that's what we did with you today. So every time people discuss, discuss uh, propagation of waves, uh, what the, well, there are, there are a few canonical examples. One of them is the vibration of membrane. Uh, there is a special Wikipedia page on that. I'll show you. And I encourage you to, re to read that page. <coughs> membrane vibration. Yeah, vibration of circular membrane. If you open this page, how do I go full screen here? Yeah, here it is. So that's one of the canonical studies they do when they study wave propagation, especially like if you discuss wave propagation on the plane, which in, in the, in the Applications would be wave propagation on the surface of, say, of reservoir of water or any other liquid. You will see the wave equation. If you just scroll down this page, that's the canonical wave equation which you have to solve if you want to see how the wave propagates in space or on the surface of your reservoir. And the right-hand side, that's these two partial derivatives we discussed with you. If your space is, is possessing some sort of circular symmetry, the first step they do when they solve this, they go to the polar coordinates, and that's the piece which we discovered with you yesterday. You see this right hand side? On the Wikipedia page, they probably just say, due to circular geometry, blah, 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 it is convenient to use cylindrical coordinates. So then the above equations are written as one sentence, which took us like 15 minutes yesterday to establish. The details, which are hidden by one this single sentence, and I guess in most of the physics books, that will be the same one sentence. Is just hiding these computations we discovered with you yesterday. And then, if you solve this in a circular form, we can discover all of these pure states of the membrane. Maybe they're here on the Wikipedia page, let's just see. Yes, all of these pure states, S states. Oops. I'm sorry, I just clicked something which I shouldn't click. You can discover all of the states of vibration, the S states, the P states, even, that's all P states, that's right, D states, all of these pure states, they will come up as a solution to that differential equation, but you won't be able to solve it unless you have it in polar form. And the polar form, we discovered it with, it with you. That's the first comment I'd like to, I, well, I wanted to make with you, I mean, about the, about the effort we invested into this differential equation yesterday. The second, uh, topic which I'd like to discuss with you in relation to that. I'd like to do the same computations as we did yesterday, but I'd like to do it with maple. As a matter of fact, all we did yesterday together with you, we can do this with maple, and that's good, especially especially in, in, the, in the prospect that if you need to do something like this for the three-dimensional wave equation, that's the one which has f double x, f double y, f double z, I no longer 
we'll be doing this by hand. Actually, I won't be doing this anyway. But if you follow the maple, if you use the maple, the way we're going to just, I use it right now, I will use it right now for the two-dimensional case, you will discover that circular version of the wave equation. And that's, that version of the wave equation even has, has even more important applications. We'll discuss it later. I mean, just, I'll, I'll, discuss, I'll comment on this later. We'll just try maple first. So, uh, yeah, we'll just try maple first. I'll remove this. I'll take one of the terminals. I, I've been practicing this before I come here, just to avoid any stupid mistakes or something, but still it may happen, but I'll try to be flawless with my maple communication. So remember, where's my slide? Ah, here we go. Our job here with maple now, compute this piece and see that this piece actually ends up like this. We can do this with maple. It's a good skill. As a matter of fact, those chain rule questions you're going to see next time in the tutorial, if you want to boost up your maple skills, and that's always good to have good maple skills, I encourage you to do those questions with maple as well, as well as, I mean, with a hand and with maple, double checking them with maple. It's not that hard, especially when you pick up the main ideas, how to do that. Well, I'll try to deal with these ideas today, which is good for the afternoon lecture. Uh, so let's go to maple. We're going to compute this left-hand side and then see how it, how it com comes up in the, in, the circular, or in the polar coordinates. Okay, let's try it. So this is dead. I mean, this terminal is dead. I don't know why it's dead, but it doesn't matter. Let's just talk. take another one. Uh, full screen, I just zoom in, maybe a little bit more, yeah, like this. Is it clearly seen from the back row? Good. I just need to go to the other machine, where I have, which has maple. My laptop doesn't have maple. I go to my office machine, which has maple. We're going to run maple in that. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, not encouraging, isn't it? But still, it's, it's not, not, nothing, nothing, nothing bad with that. So we need to compute two partial derivatives, right? Double by x, double by y. In maple, it's a div command. Here it is, div command. And now I supply the function, which we're going to differentiate, which look with which, which, which function I'm going to type in. F, uh, yes, because we, we just we remember that my I approach when I did this by hand, and that's actually the reason we do it by hand first, because without doing this by hand, I don't think you can design the proper approach in Maple to do the same thing. So Maple is not a substitute for the, our, our uh, hand effort yesterday. It, it is a substitute in terms of like if you want to extend it to something else, like three dimensions, that's right, it will, will speed up the process. But for the first time, if you've if you never done it by hand, I don't think you will ever do it by, with Maple. Anyway, so if you remember when we did it yesterday, we sort of used this inverse polar thing. We didn't know how they, how they look exactly, but we used them. I'm going to use it here as well. Look at this. I'm going to say Rxy, Txy. I don't have theta in maple, so I'm going to use letter T for theta. So this Rxy, Txy, these are my inverse polar. So here's my function, right? F of R and T, which in turn of X and Y. And now I'd like to differentiate this twice with respect to x first, right? x, well, in maple, if you want to do twice, you can do it like that. Dollar sign and 2, or you can, you can do double x if you wish. It's another way, another syntax if you want to produce double derivative of a function with respect to the argument. So I do double derivative, semicolon. That's a something we computed on the slide before. Quite lengthy, horrible expression. We don't have to look exactly into it. But that's how it is. If you look back on the slide from yesterday, we had this already. We had it like with more structure because Maple doesn't care about the structure. When yesterday we presented this, I tried to keep the structure because when you keep the structure, things seem easier, a lot easier. Here's, we don't have structure here, but it's, it's all right because we, in our heads, we do have a structure from yesterday. So that's the first part, double x derivative. Now I, I add another double y derivative, right? So I'll just copy this. Can I copy this? I can copy this. Plus, it's a second, but this time by y, it will be even lengthy expression, uh, a horrible expression, lengthy and horrible, but we can deal with that. Let me just make an assi assignment, so I just 
I assign it to something A capital. Oh, what did they happen? Ah, A capital. A capital. Probably it's not. Do you see this bottom line there? Yeah. So I do the assignment. That's my A capital, and I'm, and that's the, that's the starting point for my maple computations. Now, probably it's. Uh, well, what I discovered while, while I was practic practicing with this, when Maple prints things, like when he prints, when, well, sorry, when it prints for me this result of this value of A, it uses two different notations. One of them, like you see, it uses uh, D by DX, which takes lots of space. Or sometimes it uses this capital D notation. Just pay attention. Just pick up any derivative from this line. For instance, this one, D, D2 by DX square. I'll apply one simplify function to my A. Simplify. If I simplify this expression, if I request Maple to simplify it, look what it did. It just changed the way it prints it into this uh, inline notation with the capital D, you see? Like in here, for instance. D12 F. What does it mean? It means that you differentiate, D capital you differentiate, 1, 2, that's the First, you differentiate with respect to the first variable, and then second derivative with respect to the second variable. So this is second order derivative with respect to r and t, because r is the first variable, t is the second variable. I'm going to keep it in this notation because it takes less space. That's my a, so I'm going to reassign a. So a will be simplify or fail like that. And then now my a takes a, like a the shorter form. But that's the starting point. Now we're gonna replace, if you look carefully inside, if you look carefully inside, probably, why not, so let me just, I can't, no, I will keep the full screen. If you look carefully inside, you got plenty of these derivatives of your inverse polar maps, like the one which I just selected. It's a First derivative of R with respect to the second own argument. That's how you read this. You see D derivative brackets. In brackets, you've got two second, uh, second own argument, R function, and the arguments. So here, in the classical denotations, you're looking at dr by dx. First derivative. I hope you see that. All of these derivatives, we yesterday we made an effort and we found them. Here it is. Yesterday, we made an F and we found that this R by X, here it is. R by Y, here it is. Thetas, which are T this time, all of them present, second order. All of them we found. Now we need to do the same effort with Maple. And we can do it with Maple, I'll show you. So for instance, second order derivatives for the R here, for instance, this, you see, this, this one, D double two, uh, D two and two R. It's a second order derivative of R taken twice with respect to the second argument. So it's actually R double Y, right? So look how we're gonna compute this, this, all of these derivatives of the inverse polar. For that, we have the implicit diff function in Maple. Look what it does. Place it diff. As a first argument, you supply a set where you give your equations defining your implicit map. In our case, that's the polar. This time it's a forward polar, not the inverse, but the forward polar. Here it is. X equal R times cos T, Y equal R times sine T. Here's the two maps which define my inverse polar. Now you specify as a second argument, is another set, those two letters, those two symbols, which I use as, a, as functions. This time we R and T are my functions. Like this, and then you specify the derivative you'd like to compute. Well, one of the things which I discovered yesterday, it's better to start with the second of the derivatives. So we'll just try our function by x twice. If I just hit the enter now, look at this. Maple does the computer. Well, it's, it's well, Maple does the computation. It's actually it requires some simplifications. If I wrap around the simplify function around it, like this. If I wrap around simplify function around this, and I ask for, if I ask for the result, here it is, sine t squared by r. Let's just look back at the slide we did yesterday. This one we computed, look at this, we computed r by x twice. 
look back here, R by X twice, well, here we have the Rx notations. Well, if you take this R square here as the enumerator, it will be R square take X, oh. R square take take X square and R Q, uh, cube, sorry. That's a kind of expression. Uh, I should have split it. I can do like that. That's the expression we have. From keeping in mind that x squared is a r squared cos theta. That's my polar up here. That's my polar. If you use this polar in here, it will be r squared take r squared cos squared, which by the fundamental, or by the main trigonometric identity, will be r squared by sine squared theta. R squared cancels out with this R cube, and we come up exactly with what Maple gave us. <coughs> Sine squared by R. You see? It's exactly the one we found by hand. So now I have this expression for the derivative. Here's the derivative itself. So it's a derivative. Which one is this? It's a derivative uh, by X. So it's 1 and 1, right? It's a D, one and one, so by X once, and by X again, by the first ohm, by the first ohm of function R and X, Y. That's the kind of derivative we're looking at. So I want to just, just what I would like to make, I'd like to make the, uh, I would like Maple to, to print out the equation, actually, rather than just a value. So you see, if I do like that, Maple prints out the equation, symbolic derivative of the left, on the left-hand side, and actual value on the right-hand side. Why do I do that? Because next, as a next stage, I can use the subs function. It's a third function we need to know. It's the one which makes substitutions in the expressions. And I say, take this identity we just discovered, percentage sign. It's the one which refers to the line just printed. So it refers to this line. So you take this line you just printed and, and use the right-hand side as a substitute for the left-hand side across my A expression. So when I finish this command, all of the appearances of D11R, like in here, for instance, will be replaced with sine T squared by R. Yeah, that's the replacement. It's still a horrible expression. Hardly you can put your eyes around it, but we can see some appearance of sine and R here. If I was doing this just without having this guidance from my handwritten computations, probably it would be harder to believe that everything goes and goes and goes according to the plan, but because we have this Beacon from yesterday. I think we should be fine. Well, this you can simplify this a little bit. So I'll, I'll put the simplify function around this. Oh, I can't do it like that because right now percentage sign refers to the last printed line, which is no longer the one which we need. So let me just do it like that. I'll repeat the command which I'll repeat the command which made the line for the substitution. Now I repeat the command for the subs. I'll wrap around the simplify call around it. And I make the assumption to A again. So it's like this. So after this, after the substitution is completed, the new value go back into A. Here it is. Now I have to do this another three times with another four partial derivatives. For instance, now I go another second order derivative. So this time two and two. Of R, I know actually it's more than three times. Yeah, it's four times, three times. Well, we'll see in a second. So it's two and two. So this time R by the second argument twice. Second argument of R. So here I altered two Y. Yeah, I just altered Y. Mm, that's right. Here's a derivative of R twice by Y cos squared. Theta divided by R. This is the value. This is the value we had on my slide from yesterday. And now I'll make this up again. I don't know if you know it. When you hit the up, when you hit the up arrow on the keyboard, the maple just recalls the command from before. So I just repeat this command again. When I make a substitution, now percentage refers to this new line we just printed. And here's my substitution. That's right. So I think the second order R derivatives are gone from this expression. Both of them we just substituted. Now we have second order T derivatives, just one of them here. 
You see, G double two. Yeah, G, G, G twice with respect to the second argument. Uh, here's the G one one of G. Here it is. These two also require substitutions carefully. Look at this. Again, I call up the command which brings up my substitution line. This time it will be one one of T. And here I, I need to make the alterations here. It will be T function by X twice. Yes, T function by X twice. Here's a line. And now I just substitute this line into my A again. Another substitution. Hmm, we're getting closer. Sec final second order partial derivative. It's D2 and 2 of T. So it's T by Y twice. It's still here somewhere. If you look carefully for the expression, you can find here one of them. That's one instance of that. So if I call this line, that's the value, which we sub in. Oh, it's getting shorter and shorter. We're still looking at the replacement of first order derivatives. Here's one of them. Here's another one. So actually, I'm wrong. Altogether, eight substitutions we need to make. So four second order, four first order. If you're good with maple, you can do it in one command with, with some effort. There will be some syntax error when you build that command, but it's not my purpose. We just I do it step by step. In, the, in principle, you can just collect all of the, all of these substitutions in one command with some effort, and yes, and that will be quicker in that case. But the quicker is not the objective today. Uh, so here's my another four substitutions carefully. So this time we'll just go R again, and here one. So it's R by X once. So it's R on the right hand side by X once. Here it is, R by X. Just cos theta, that's the one we knew from the from the from yesterday. It's even simpler than the second of the derivatives. Uh, and I take my and I make my substitution like this. Another two. So second by R, and here will be Y evaluation and substitution. Oh no, it's only three lines left, you see. Originally it was like a maybe a dozen of lines. Now we have only three left. Last two substitutions for the T function. D1 of T. So it's a T by the first own argument. So here you got T, here you got X on this side. T and X. That's the value. And that's the substitution. And now we hold our breath, because if we did something wrong, nothing good will come up. T by second variable, so T by Y, that's the value, and that's the substitution. We're good. It's one line, if you do the expand function of this, just to, because it's one single fraction, you see long fraction, but you can just split, I, I want to split it in individual terms. If I do the expansion, Ah, yeah, here it is. Oh, let me just make it shorter because see, originally, originally, uh, I use this inverse, I use this inverse polar maps. Now they're just sitting there making the expression longer and I'd like to make it shorter. So I'll make final sub command, sub, and I substitute we substitute right hand side for the left hand side. So every R of X, Y, I just substitute with simple R letter and every T of X, Y with a simple T letter in the expression last printed. If I make this final sub like this, just to make my expression look shorter. Oh, here we go. So look carefully what it says here. Double derivative of F by the first argument. So double F by R, first argument is R, then one derivative of f by the first argument again, so one derivative of f by r divided by r, second term, and double second derivative of f by the second argument twice, so by t, so f by t twice, by r square. Just take an image of that. Here it is. f double r, 
f double t by r square and f by r by one single r. And that this is it. Yeah. Any questions? Well, just three commands from Maple can do such a, such a big job. Diff, implicit diff, and subs. With some effort, like I said, you can build it up in one single command, or maybe a few, fewer commands, not like eight substitutions, uh, four substitutions on the second level, four on the lower level. You can probably combine this together. And I encourage you to do that. That's the only way to build the skills with Maple. Just reading the books on Maple doesn't help. You have to put your hands on it, and then it will work. So I encourage you to do that. You have plenty of the opportunity, opportunity to practice. The next week tutorial questions, there will, be, there will be lots of questions on the partial degree, which is chain rules, and that's where you can practice with this to double check your own workings. Oh, any questions? It wasn't easy. If you don't have any questions, look at this one now. Spherical one. We're not going to do it. Just no, don't panic. Don't panic. We don't have to do it. We don't have to do it. But that's actually, there's even more importance than the flat one, than the two-dimensional one. I'll show you why in a second. Uh, in principle, with Maple, now we can do it. Because now we have the vision how to do it. We have the structure from the, our two-dimensional experience. And now we have the commands to do it in Maple for three dimensions. So in principle, this can be done. And if you can do it, if you can just sum up the commands or write up a little Maple file which works for you and send it to me, I'll share this on the Moodle and on my website for everyone else. Any, any, anyone can volunteer for that? No? Well, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's an optional thing, but if you enough, have enough stamina and like challenges, we can try this. Uh, that's right. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, now, the reason I mention this as well, as I said this a few times already, uh, from the point of view of the wave equation, when you have a three-dimensional wave equation, and if you try to solve it, again, the most important case where people need to solve that wave equation, like it's just one case, actually, as a matter of fact, but it's so important that to just change the whole you know, way the history went since the, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's on the one equation which describes what we now know the uh, electronic orbitals in the hydrogen atom. So if you take this wave equation, which uh, uh, and in case of the hydrogen atom, it has this spherical symmetry. Well, it's a very normal assumption about the atoms. Uh, and if you try to solve it, and after you did the spherical substitution, there isn't a big, I mean, there isn't a big path left to, to walk through in order to find a solution. You can go, again, you can just, you can start with the Wikipedia. Not here, not here. Let's just, let's just, go, let's just Google this. Hydrogen atom orbitals. We'll just, the pictures come up straight away. Actually, it's a nice challenge. It's another interesting challenge. Whether you can build these pictures with a GNU plot. It's, it's doable. I, I, there was time in my life when I did this. Uh, Let's we'll just go first to the Wikipedia page. Atomic orbitals. Those orbitals, maybe some of you who took chemistry a little bit, you know that they say that the orbitals have different shapes. So a uh, spherical one, like a dumbbell-looking one, all of the other ones, chemists never explain where they came from. They just say that's, that's how we know it, but just to ask them why they know it, nobody will tell you. Now we know it. I mean, you know it. These are just the solutions to the, uh, to the wave equation, three-dimensional wave equation. If you, sc if you scroll down across this page, let just see the title, the uh, contents. Early models, we don't care. Quantum numbers, is probably we don't care yet. Shapes and normal complex. Uh, huh? Where, where, where is this, I wonder? I'll just try this one. These are the tables. These are the pictures. All of these, these are the shapes of those solutions. But where is my wave equation? That's a two-dimensional version of it, S type, P type. Does it say anywhere? Let's just uh, search across this page, wave equation. Hmm. 
Mm, not found, it says. That's bad. Well, actually, you need a few other. You need, need to know a few other terms to find the connection between the wave equation and the and the actual orbitals. That's the term which you need to know. Well, if you want to read more about that, you, you should Google not only the term atomic orbitals but also the term spherical harmonics. So, if you go back, back. So that's actually the shape of the orbitals, and they come as a solution of the wave equation. But mathematically, they have, there's another term for the atomic orbitals. It's called the spherical harmonics. Yeah, here it is. It's the same picture. Here it is, you see, for the spherical harmonics. So in mathematics, we sometimes call them, we call them that. The same orbitals, we just call them, in mathematics, we call them spherical harmonics. And that's my wave equation. That's the wave equation, or at least the, one of the sides of the wave equation. And if you scroll a little bit down, this is the spherical version of the wave equation. This is the other side. You can, in principle, come up in Maple before you start solving it. And the solution is explained here. All of these functions are here. If you just invest enough time, you will be able to pick up those parametric functions. You need to type in into the GNU plot to come up with the same orbitals. With some effort, you can come up with those parametric functions. But it requires some reading, of course. And that's the only example, actually, that's why we do it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the most important example of the wave equation which needs to be solved. It was first solved, like I said, first time people solved it and realized that it has influence on the hydrogen atom in the beginning of 20th century. It was a, quite a revolution and quite a revelation. And since then, differential equations became so much important. I mean, partial differential equations became so much important. Any questions? No, no questions? Right. Uh, all right, so now I have to go to, back to my main set of slides. If you saw those slides, we have only two topics extra to discuss. They're very simple, very computational one in comparison to what we've done so far. It's a directional derivative and a bit of a tangent planes discussion. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's just, let's just do it. Or plus spherical harmonics. Right. Let's just let, let's just go through the slides. They are they are simple. <clears throat> yeah. So directional derivative. It's a, a little bit. It's a development of the idea of the partial derivative. When we, define part, when we define partial derivative, we, we take these slices of the function. Well, that's a two-dimensional example. I mean, on this diagram, you have two-dimensional example, even though the whole idea works for the function of multiple, uh, multiple variables, but it's a numerical function. This idea just only developed, is developed for the numerical functions, not for the maps, Rn to Rm. Uh, so when you take partial derivatives, you take the slices, either x and y, in, in either in x or in y direction, that's what is on the diagram, is pictured in red. Now, for the directional derivative, you make this slight development of the idea when you take the slice in some other direction. So you take this little vector, which is green on my diagram, and you say, what will happen if I start increment my function along that vector? What will be the rate of change of that? That's the definition of directional derivative, right in here. It's a symbols which sometimes used. That's another symbol which is sometimes used. Sometimes used. That's a definition. Where this came from. That's a definition. So you see you, you, sometimes I can't explain what happens, but yeah, I think we can see. Uh, that's a definition. Well, look what it says. It says, take the increment the function by some vector in the direction of this u hat, u hat, C times u hat, uh, compute the increment of the function and rate it against the increment, rate it against this t parameter. Well, one interesting point here, or one point to remember here is just the vector must be unital, 
So we don't want the length of this vector to influence the directional derivative. That's why we always require that this vector, which sets the direction, it's a unital vector. Computationally, there's a formula to find its derivative, and it follows directly from the chain rule. So and that's the next slide, which explains it, explains that. So you can see this formula. I mean, if you, you can justify that formula by taking a vector function, you see, the one which takes numbers to Rn, and that's the one which is a straight line, simple straight line, you see, like this. If you consider such a function, then directional derivative, that's a definition from this slide before. You take your function, that's the increment, right? If you just take the t some positive or negative value, it will be just shifted. It will be a point shift from a in the direction of u by, by t, scaled by the unit length. This is the value of the function at the point a itself. R of naught, it's the a point, right? It's just the a point itself. So that's the definition of the directional derivative, but this time, you can also see it as a derivative of a numerical function given by this composition. So it's a chain rule case. That's the case to use a chain rule. It's a composition of two functions. And if you use that chain rule, that's, that's where we use the chain rule. You see the matrix notation is used here, which in this case, this dr, it's the column vector, right? Because we have n values of my function and one variable t. So it's a n by one matrix. This one is one by n, right? Because function has one numerical value and n arguments. So it's a multiplication of row matrix by column matrix, which is effectively dot product, simple dot product. And that is what is said here. Dot product of the gradient vector, which is exactly this one by n matrix and the u vector because this derivative is just a u vector it's, it's a linear function so when you differentiate by t it, it will be the u vector itself so that's the formula which is normally used in computations for directional derivative and that's what you're going to use yeah that's that's the, that's the, we just on this slide uh, it is framed as a theorem it says that if, if you have a differentiable function and you need the function to be differentiable because you need these symbols to make sense in the chain rule to work. If the function is differentiable, then the, the, uh, the directional derivative in the direction of u vector given by this dot product. Gradient at the point A times the u vector. Right. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. What's the upside-down Upside down triangle? Yes. Well, it's a symbol which is called nabla, the symbol itself. We read it, we read it nabla, N-A-B-L. A, yes. Uh, but normally in this course, the symbol never appears alone. It's always come with a function. It always comes with a function. And with the function, when nabla next to f, it means the gradient of f. Do you have any problems with the gradient? Do you know what the gradient is? Uh, well, I don't have a slide to show you, but I can Google that for you. <laughs> Yeah, nabla f, and that's what it is. So it's a combination of partial derivatives, all first order partial derivatives, as components of a vector. Right in here. Yeah. Oh, it's a three dimensional version, you see, i, j, k vectors. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, back to my slide. Right. So we'll just see what the other, the other one has. Uh, a few properties of the directional derivative right here. Uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, that's the one which you can use to control to control the dot product. If you use that Cauchy-Schwarz, that's, that's the way it uses. You see, we, if you compute the magnitude of the directional derivative, which is a dot product, that's the magnitude of the dot product, by Cauchy-Schwarz, Cauchy-Schwarz is used here on this, at this stage, dot product never exceeds the length of individual factors involved in the dot product. That's what it said here. The u length is 1. Remember, u is always chosen unital vector, so it's just a one factor. And that's the gradient. So from here, you can conclude that the 
magnitude of a directional derivative never exceeds the magnitude of the gradient vector of that function. Yeah. Before we go on, actually, there's a typo in this line. Do you see the typo? Has anyone spotted a typo? Can you tell me this value, f dash u hat of a? What is it by nature? What's the nature of this? of the symbol. Is it a fruit? <laughs> no, it's not the fruit, right? So we can, we can rule out the fruit possibility, right? Good. What's the nature of this object if it's not a fruit? A limit. limit. Oh, you, you can be a lot simpler than that. Number. Yes, that's a number. You just... <laughs> Well, if it's a number, what's the double line around the number means? Well, that's the type where the typo is supposed to be absolute value, not the double line. Because the, this, I, I intentionally use the term magnitude, not to hint that this is supposed to be the absolute value when I just read this line to you. But it's supposed to be just the absolute value. So the absolute value of the directional derivative, which is a number, never exceeds the magnitude, now it's a proper use of a term, of a gradient, because gradient is a vector. The same type, type of persists in the second part of this line because the dot product, in uh, the nature of a dot product, it's a number. Must be the absolute value around it. Uh, right, so the line itself says that the absolute value of the uh, directional derivative never exceeds gradient. Equality sometimes occurs, and I think the slide lists when exactly this happens. So it says the maximum rate of change in the direction happens when the Direction is taken in the direction of the gradient. Well, the, that comes again from the from the nature of the dot product. If you remember geometrical interpretation of the dot product, that's the product of magnitudes of the vectors involved and the cosine of the angle in between, right? So, if the magnitude of, magnitudes of your vectors involved are not changing, in fact, one of them is just one, u hat, the magnitude of u hat is just one. The magnitude of the gradient may be not one, but it's still fixed. If you just alter the angle between the direction in which you compute the rate of change and the gradient, the max of this value, the max of the product of the magnitudes and the cos of the angle in between, will happen when they're exactly pointing in the same direction, when cos is one and when the angle is zero. And that's, that, that, that's exactly what is said here. The maximum rate of change happens when the cos becomes one, and when angle becomes zero, and when the directions are the same. The maximum negative rate of change happens when the cos becomes negative one, so the angle becomes 180 degrees, and the vectors are pointing in the exactly opposite directions. That's the second line here. So the gradient, geometrically, for a function, it shows the direction of the maximum rate of change, the direction in which the directional derivative delivers the highest possible value. The opposite direction of the gradient delivers the direction in which directional derivatives, too many directional, gives you the, well, it's not the, uh, yeah, well, the, the, the most negative rate of change. That's the best way to say it, I guess. Any questions? Well, another interesting point on this slide says that, it says this, if you take, if you ask yourself when it happens that the directional derivative is zero. What is the direction in which, your, in, uh, in which your function doesn't change? So the rate of change is zero. According to the properties of the dot product, your angle must, the, your cost must be zero. We rule out the possibility that the magnitudes are zero, which is the not. So you just, if you're just playing with the angle, the cost must be zero, meaning that the angle must be 90 degrees. So your direction, must be perpendicular to the gradient. So the direction perpendicular to the gradient gives you the direction in which function does not change. It's a geometrical interpretation of the, of the direction derivative we get. Yeah. 
Well, in this diagram, yeah, that's what's happening here. So you see, if you take the level curves of your function, here they are, well, schematically, here they are, uh, the function changes the most rapidly when you go towards the uh, towards the, this highest point of this hill, let's just take it like that, and the, and the gradient in that case will point, if you take the gradient somewhere here, it will point exactly in the direction of this red vector, towards the point, towards the highest point on your, on your hill. The opposite direction gives you the rate of highest decay, highest descent, whereas the perpendicular direction gives you the direction in which your function doesn't change, gives you the direction of the level curve, because level curve, that's the points where the function keeps the same values. That's geometrical interpretation of what we just discovered. Any questions? All right, if you don't have any questions, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow.